We're gonna do this for real this time. I'm kind of nervous. I'm not sure what I'm getting myself into. This could get ugly. Here we are again in the MLS. And we're going to actually figure out these stupid registration rules this time around instead of just complaining about them. We've got a bunch of complicated rules to worry about. We've also got a restricted transfer window, whatever that means. For some reason it lasts for like a year. And we've got all sorts of overlapping and confusing rules. Welcome to the wonderful world of Major League Soccer management. There's a reason why most self-respecting football manager players stay far away from this mess. You need a spreadsheet just to figure out what the rules are. Okay, let me try to explain this, assuming that I actually understand it correctly. You've got 30 players total on your MLS team. 20 of those roster slots count as senior roster slots. Those slots have a salary cap of $5,470,000 in 2024. I think it was a little smaller in 2023. The remaining 10 players count on the supplemental roster and don't count against the salary budget. Supplemental roster players are subject to their own salary requirements. There's also a limit to the number of players that can be on reserve roster contracts and stuff like that, but we're not going to worry too much about them since they're mostly fringe players anyway. We're going to focus on the players who are actually subject to the salary cap. Now, you can have up to three players who are so-called designated players, and this is where it gets strange. You can pay them more than the maximum salary. This is also known as the Beckham rule since David Beckham was the first designated player back in 2007. Yeah, this is basically a rule that lets MLS teams go wild by signing foreign players in their retirement age. You can break the salary cap with up to three players, which is pretty crazy if you're going to have a salary cap. And let me tell you, you know you've really got a strong salary cap when you have all sorts of special rules to break it. So, going back to the screen, we can see that we have filled up three of our three allotted designated player slots. That part is taken care of. Thankfully, the geniuses of Reddit have some good advice for managing in the MLS. One major piece of advice is to make sure that your squad is built around those designated players. Yeah, this should be an obvious strategy, but you'd be surprised. Of course, you want to get the best players that you can in those three slots, and you naturally want to stay away from wasting them on players who are aging and who aren't going to do you much good. There's other stuff to worry about, like this Under-22 initiative project. To be honest though, I didn't really spend much time even thinking about that. Now, real life DC United fans will be upset, but the first thing I did was to get rid of Christian Benteke. I traded him away early on to Colorado for a draft pick. Okay, there are two things to talk about here. First of all is trades. Trades are an old American sporting tradition. The salaries are actually tied to the leagues, not the team. So you're basically swapping the rights to one player for another without redoing the contract. Yeah, I know, it's really strange. It doesn't make sense when you think about it. The second is the draft, which in the MLS is a huge pain in the neck. You do a draft of college players once a year. I skipped it, I ignored it, I tried to get rid of most of my tra draft picks to uh, win today. And so we're not going to talk about that. And yeah, I mean, this whole setup just feels wrong to me. Now, Benteke is not an awful player. My problem with him is that he's old, 32 years old at the start of this save. Plus, he's on an, ex an expensive contract and he uses up one of those precious designated player slots. The hilarious thing is that Colorado tried to get rid of him not long after they traded us for him. It wasn't just my imagination. One of the best pieces of Reddit advice I saw was to scout players with an American second nationality. This is actually quite overpowered, as you'll see in a second. I went to the player search feature and looked at players who had American listed as a second nationality. I did two general passes of this, one to find players to bring in on trial and another to find players we could buy. And as usual, I was exclusively looking for players with high pace and acceleration. I found 23 year old Justin McMaster early on and signed him. He's not the best winger in the game, but he's faster than the other guys on the right that we had, so this was a good signing. But Ken Abo was our ma real major signing. We bought him from Norwich. Abo was basically a foreign signing, but one with an American second nationality, which means that he doesn't count as a foreign player. He's 18 years old, and he's a star player at such a young age. He's not perfect, but he's fast, and fast is what I was going for. All right, there are two more things to keep in mind when you manage an MLS roster. Now, these will make your life a whole lot easier. 
First, remember that you don't need to sign the best players for every position. You need players who can play the positions reasonably well, and it's best to have a mix of some youth and some experience. But you'll go nuts if you try to construct a team of expensive players since you'll keep hitting that stupid salary cap. I should note something here. The MLS salary cap actually works to the benefit of marginal players. Why? Because they're always going to have a job with one team or another. It also provides a huge incentive for good native players to go abroad as soon as they possibly can. Why? Because there's always going to be a cap on how much they can earn in the United States. I'm not convinced that the people who created this salary cap and this whole crazy system thought carefully about the incentives that it creates. Second, keep some roster spots open. The AI will make crazy mistakes and will be forced to put really good players on waivers. That means you can buy them for nothing and supplement your squad. Look out especially for players who are under 22 since there is a limit to the number of under 22 initiative players that you can have on your roster at one time and the AI always screws this one up. Yeah, that's right. The strategy that works is to keep holes in your roster and wait for good players to just fall on your lap through the waiver system. I'm 100% serious. I should explain waivers for a second. In theory, the waiver system allows less successful clubs to pick off players no longer wanted from bigger clubs. In reality, it looks like this. You get a list in your inbox of waived players and you have two days to make a claim on them. For a small sum of money, you can get the rights to the player without having to do a trade or any of that ridiculousness. As you can see, I was able to get three young players off waivers early on. They actually didn't play much, but they were important backup pieces. Yeah, the other thing here to wrap your head around is how trades actually work. I had four keepers and I only needed two. I wanted to sell one. But as you can see here, I couldn't get anybody to give me anything for either one of them. It's pretty frustrating actually. The player's value has nothing to do with the fake money you can theoretically get for that player and the game really doesn't help much in letting you know what is and what is not a good deal. In the end, I actually let both of those keepers go for nothing. In the end, the roster spots were much more important to me than receiving anything in return. I mean, I suppose I could have just unregistered them. That would have made them automatically subject to the waiver process. Overall, it really is a strange system. It's even stranger when you look at general allocation money and targeted allocation money. As I understand, those exist only to offset money that would count against your salary cap. In other words, you're actually not going to look at this screen all that often in your MLS save. It isn't relevant. This is the screen that you really care about. General allocation money and targeted allocation money remind me a lot of the fake currencies that you see in games with microtransactions. It's hard to say how much real money they are worth, and you can't exchange it for real money. It only has a limited use in-game, or in real life in the salary cap game. Yeah, if you haven't guessed by now, Major League Soccer isn't, exa isn't exactly a great example of free market economics. You're probably wondering why America has this ridiculous system in place. Well, let's dig in. The last time we talked about this, I mentioned that soccer was a big thing in the United States in the 1920s and that includes the District of Columbia. During the initial global rise of association football, major American cities were caught up in the excitement. And yes, there were two professional leagues in the United States at that time. Don't let this Washington Post article fool you though. The leagues they're talking about here are local amateur leagues, not professional leagues. As strange as it sounds, there was actually no professional team or even semi-pro team in Washington DC or the area at all during that time, especially the 20s. There were thousands of people around here who played the sport, amateur leagues abounded, but apparently nobody thought of putting a pro team in the nation's capital or even a semi-pro team. It really is strange. DC's first soccer team was the Britannica Soccer Club, an amateur side in the National Soccer League. That club was formed in 1963. The mastermind was a Scottish man named Norman Sutherland who worked initially for the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. He became the face of soccer in the District of Columbia not long after he came to the U.S. By 1968, the club had changed its name to the Washington Darts. That's fitting because Britannica was kind of an embarrassing name once that club moved past its amateur beginnings. Soon, the semi-pro team was showing signs of becoming a full-fledged professional side. By January 1970, the Darts had joined the North America Soccer League. However, by May 1971, the Darts were in extreme financial trouble. The problem was money. The problem has always been money. 
The Darts originally played at a high school up in Northwest DC. They soon moved to a small college football stadium in Brooklyn, which is up in the Northeast. However, attendance was poor, and Sutherland didn't exactly do anything to endear himself to the fans of amateur soccer in the district. The Darts were lucky to get even 3,000 fans to turn out to their games, and most of them started to boo Sutherland. By mid-August, the fr franchise had been sold and moved to Miami. The team was always obscure, but is less than a normal footnote in history today. I doubt you can find a single person in DC who remembers them. Now, after looking at that, you can probably understand why the MLS is so jealous with its player salaries. I mean, it prevents free agency, it puts stringent salary limits on players, and so on. The hope is to do whatever possible to prevent teams from just going under. And teams just going under was actually really common in the earlier days of professional soccer in the United States. The darts were so despised that the asking price for the club was $25,000. That was the same as the fee for an expansion team in the NASL. In other words, the club was worthless. Now, 1971 was a pretty sad year for DC sports fans. I'm not sure many people were upset about the darts, of course, but people were absolutely livid about baseball's Washington Senators. The Senators moved to Texas at the end of that year, led by owner Bob Short, who thought up every excuse possible to get the team out. Fans showed their disapproval of Short using banners at RFK Stadium, which was the Senators' home park. And the final home game was ended prematurely in an absolute riot. Fans swarmed onto the field in protest. Though Bob Short is a distant memory, his name does come back up from time to time in the world of Washington, D.C. sports. We'll talk more about RFK Stadium in a little bit. First, though, let's get back to the football manager season. We were expected to finish 25th, which isn't far from where DC United are in real life. Now, in the interest of full transparency, I went out and got another downloadable tactic. I got the Knapp tactic that was highest rated for the current FM24 match engine. And here it is, the magical tactic. Ah yes, this tactic, it's called the HGF4231MCSLO whatever. It was the highest scoring one. Knapp really needs to go back to giving code names that are actual words. And I was ready for my debut. We came out to a flying start, destroying Dallas in our first match, 5 0. Floated through. Drilled in low. Oh, how's that for a goal? We had some success in the early season, winning twice and losing once, nothing out of the ordinary. We were fortunate to receive a gifted own goal in our home opener, beating Seattle 2-1 late in extra time. But things didn't go all that well at first. Our biggest embarrassment of the season was getting kicked out of the Open Cup against Hartford, giving up two goals in quick succession. Example for any wannabe footballers out there. But we followed that one up by going on a remarkable winning streak. Seriously, we looked absolutely untouchable. Maybe it was the tactic, I don't know. I tend to think that it was a combination of a good tactic, good morale, good players, and a little bit of luck. We won the close ones, and we also had a few blowouts thrown in there for good measure. Whatever the reason, by the summer break, we were in first place. And that brought us to the League's Cup. If I understand this right, the League's Cup includes all teams from the United States and Mexico. It's a single elimination summer tournament, and there is a possible spot in the CONCACAF Champions Cup on the line. Okay, I seriously had never heard of this thing before starting to save. I guess that shows you how much I know about American soccer. Anyway, the board didn't care about winning the cup at all. Naturally, that meant that we won the whole thing. It was Joao Paulo, an older signing I reluctantly made at the end of the preseason, who scored the cup-winning goal for us deep in extra time. Yes! And that gave us the first major victory of the season. The board naturally announced that they knew we were capable of winning the thing all along, but at least they were nice enough to celebrate the victory with us. Frantically trying to save face? Yeah, that's an American soccer tradition. Well, back in January 1974, Washington, D.C. was awarded a new NASL franchise, the Diplomats. 
In that grand NASL tradition, the diplomats had like a few months to put everything together since they were starting the season that year, 1974. Hey, at least they had a nickname, though diplomats is kind of odd. They were called the Dips. I guess DC kind of has a tradition of those self-deprecating names. For example, the Washington Commanders, the American football team, are affectionately called the Commies for short. But the Dips? That's just crazy. The fortunes of the Dips rose along with the meteoric rise of the NASL. Though they started out at a high school stadium in Fairfax, Virginia, they were soon back to RFK Stadium in the district. By 1980, the Dips had picked up a familiar face. That led to some massive crowds, such as this near sellout at RFK Stadium for a nationally televised game in summer 1980. Of course, the quality of play was questionable at best. But even the biggest stars in the world weren't enough to keep the Dips alive. By the end of that same 1980 season, the Dips were dead, citing $6 million in losses. Yeah, the NASL, trying to save face, tried to create a second version of the Dips for the 1981 season. However, attendance for them was even worse. And then that led to the craziest of all face-saving exercises, Team America 1983. The idea here was to have an NASL franchise made up entirely of players for the U.S. national team. In theory, they could develop the skills necessary to finally get the United States back into the World Cup. In reality, the best players refused to leave their clubs, forcing some creative roster building. Team America had the ugliest uniforms in American soccer history and played even worse. Despite the best intentioned advertising campaigns, attendance was absolutely dreadful. It looks like they had a good-sized crowd in this June game against Fort Lauderdale. The truth is, however, that most of these 50,000 fans came for a Beach Boys concert which followed the game. Team America's average home attendance was closer to 13,000. In the end, Team America wound up with the worst record in the NASL's penultimate season, a failed experiment that nobody wants to remember. Maybe they were the real dips all along. Yeah, it turns out that Americans would rather watch teams that they have an actual connection to than all-star teams that are slapped together at the last moment. Who would have thought? Maybe they should have called them Team America World Police, huh? Anyway, let's go back to the save. We were a little shaky in September, but it worked out for the best. We wound up clinching the Supporters' Shield at the end of September after a draw with Charlotte. The Supporters' Shield is the prize given to the MLS team with the highest point total. We clinched it about three weeks before the season ended. And, like it says here, it had been a long time since DC United had last won the competition like this. The last time was 2007. Now, DC United were a force to be reckoned with in the early years of the MLS, winning the MLS Cup four times and the Supporters' Shield an additional four times. Well, it's been quiet since 2007. I guess you could call it the curse of RFK Stadium. RFK Stadium was famous for rafters that would bend and sway with the crowd, especially a full crowd. Okay, time to reminisce a little bit. I went to RFK once for a DC United game back in 2010. I went with a few colleagues from work. The team wasn't very good and the stadium was mostly empty. However, we were in what I guess you would call the ultras section, and the seats were swaying and bouncing with the chants and the music, most of which was in Spanish and was obscene. It really was a wild atmosphere, and it was a lot more interesting than the plastic parks that you see in MLS today. Well, curse or no curse, we were setting records left and right. First was a record for most goals in a season. And then was another record, this time for most wins in a season. We had our youth intake around this time, though as you can see, we can't even see star ratings for these players. You can sign some of these players in theory, though most will want to stay with their academies. Yeah, it's a bizarre system. I really don't understand why it works like this in a football manager. Maybe one of you know, maybe you can figure it out. But as far as I'm concerned, the youth academies are just an absolute mess. Seriously, by this point, I just want to have a normal save. I want my youth intake to go to my team. Anyway, we ignored the youth intake idiocy and focused on Columbus, who we crushed in both legs of the first round of the playoffs. And that was followed by weeks of friendlies. Yeah, that's the part that I don't get. 
The MLS is dead set on having some sort of playoff at the end of the season to make it look like American sports. It's a TV thing. We all know this. The problem though is that you wind up with these ridiculous holes of like three weeks for whatever reason in the middle of the playoffs. And be warned, if you play an MLS season and you start winning, the season just drags on and on and on. We were able to sneak past Philadelphia in the Eastern Conference semifinal, though only by a single goal. The Eastern final was a bit easier. We dominated Cincinnati. And the final against the LA Galaxy was a joke from the start. They didn't know what hit them. Squeezed up out wide. Simple as you like. Good. Bounces it across. Oh, that's an old goal. Football manager called it a trouble for some reason. Whatever. We won the MLS and that's what counts. And I'm apparently one of the greatest American managers of all time after a single season. Well, there you have it. We managed to survive an entire season in the MLS. I mean, we didn't just survive, we won the whole thing. Now, I still think that the sport would be much better off in the United States without all the silly salary caps and all this other nonsense. And if you want to play an American football manager, I really strongly suggest looking into one of the editor data files. If you play with the game as it comes out of the box, it's a really frustrating process, though in this case, it felt pretty good to win.